Uh, Robert, you mentioned you were out in the country, but <laughs> this is a way out in the country. Yes, we are. We're out in the middle of kind of nowhere. We enjoy it out here. We have a little private airstrip facility here. We have a 7,500 square foot uh, hangar workshop here on the facility, the little runway. Uh, we can hang about 12, 14 airplanes here at any given time. And then we're expanding down the back. We have an 18,000 square foot shop that we're adding on. 18,000 square feet? Yes, sir. We, we end up purchasing a 100 by 180, all free span. So we'll be able to get quite a few airplanes in there and have a nice showroom for customers to come visit. Now, how did you, you know, get involved in doing what you're doing now? Uh, it started like everybody. is just a young child, uh, interested in aviation. I built model airplanes. Uh, you control, radio control, that type of thing. And then um, about two weeks before I turned 16, I decided I was one to learn to fly. There was no one in my family flying whatsoever. So I had some radio control airplanes. So I simply just sold my stuff, uh, started taking flying lessons. And uh, after my very first flight, actually, I should back up just a little bit. Uh, when I was 15, I was down at the airport and I saw a guy in a T6. And I stopped and started visiting with him. He was wiping it down. I asked if I could help. He gave me a couple odds and ends, a little chores here to do. And uh, when he was getting ready to take off, he walked over and said, would you like to go flying? I said, absolutely, I'd love to. So my very first airplane ride was in a T6 as a kid, 15. And a year later, I started getting my license. And then, of course, I had to be 17. I got my license when I turned 17. So, but getting a license and learning how to fly is totally different than what I've known you'd be doing all these years, is building World War I replicas. Why? build the replicas why use the type of construction materials and stuff you're using well it all it kind of grew from one thing to another uh, obviously i got my pilot's license and uh i was shopped around i had bought a couple table airplanes cubs and champs and things over the years and, and i wanted an antique airplane like every kid likes biplanes and if a biplane's good a triplane must be better so in 1989 i decided I, I would really like to build a triplane so i started shopping around i couldn't find anything found a few pieces of information plans and stuff but nobody doing any modern materials time constraints you know you know original wood construction very, very time consuming so my background in mechanical engineering i'd worked my way through college as a machinist i thought you know i've got some skill set here i think i could develop my own world war one replica so i, I built a full-scale triplane in 1989 uh simply for the pleasure of, of having and owning my own triplane so completed that airplane within a year uh, actually, I started, I guess, in 88. I finished in 89. Uh, took it up to Oshkosh, because that's what you do every year, right? You go to Oshkosh, the air show, and, and look at airplanes. And uh, over the course of that week or so, I had just a lot of people ask where I had the kit. You know, and I said, well, I built it from scratch. And then the next question was, well, when are you going to offer a kit? And I said, well, I never really thought of this. So that's kind of how the business came about. I went home. I thought about it a little bit. I said, maybe we should go ahead and offer a kit for this aircraft. So we then... Uh, came back in 1990 and introduced the aircraft in kit form and that was kind of the birth of the business uh, and every basically every year I come along and say I want a different World War I airplane and I build something that I'm passionate about or I love and uh, if it becomes a kit fine if it doesn't but fortunately every aircraft we built to date people ask about and we've, we've since produced kits for them. Now the first airplane you built though was that did you have to actually build a set of plans for it and and, and I mean that I'm trying to find out how you developed a technique for this type of building. Well, uh, yes, I drew the plans up. Uh, again, I told you my background was in machinist, uh, so I, I was a metal worker. I understand aluminum, uh, and we used a lot of aluminum tube in the company I worked for, and, and that was just something I was very comfortable with. Uh, and I, you know, we've welded 4130 airplanes over the years. Everybody knows you take two pieces of tubing, you weld it together. Well, I said, why don't we just simply take a two pieces of aluminum and put a rivet gusset in the intersection? That way you don't have to have special welding skills and things like that. And you know, this, this is not totally unique to us. That this design, this aluminum tube and rivet construction has been around in different forms over the years. There was some of it dates clear back into the Hawker Sea Furies. There were some riveted aluminum structures that then had uh, skins around them. So it's, it's not totally new, but we've kind of developed and refined it. And uh, we have a pretty nice process for building light, simple airplanes. Now, the first airplane that you built you didn't have the equipment that you just walked me around with. That's We've correct. got CMC machines. We've got all kinds. How, what was involved in that first one as far as the, what type of uh, uh, equipment did you require? Well, these airplanes can all be built with your most basic hand tools. Uh, we did initially. Everything was cut with a hacksaw. Every cope was done with a file. Uh, and and we, we built first several airplanes like that. But having worked as a machinist, I had friends who owned machine shops and stuff, and I was able to contract and use their shop time in the evenings and weekends. 
and make some of the specialty parts like the engine attached fittings, axles, spindles, that type of thing. So I would go over to their machine shop, I would make those items. And of course then when we started producing kits, we, we would just include that kind of thing in the kit. In our kit, we basically like to say, you should be able to take delivery of this kit to the tailgate of a truck in the wilderness and you should be able to build it. Anything that requires more than a basic hand tool, we've already done. If it gets welded, we've done it. If it gets machined, we've done it. If it's a casting, we've already cast it and machined it. If it's a spinning or an English wheel part, we've already done it. So we try to set the kits up to the fact that uh, you can do it with your absolute most basic hand tools. Now, grant you, a belt sander is a little nicer than a file. A uh, little bandsaw beats a hacksaw. Uh, a, a, in mill and a drill press can do a lot of coping versus files. So, so there's you know tools help a lot, but you can build the airplane with just the very basic tools. And but Robert, there must be a lot of parts that are unique to these airplanes. I mean, you, you, it'd be very difficult for somebody, for example, for myself, to have a wheel that would work on you know one of these World War One replicas. That's correct. You know, over the years building as many airplanes as we have, you run into the the. The, the pitfalls and the shortages on certain things. And, and then every time we run into one of those, we simply address it from a manufacturing perspective. A wheel is a good example. Uh, most uh, of these antique airplanes use the larger diameter wheels. And over the years, what people have tried to do is take motorcycle tires and modify them. It doesn't work very well because motorcycle tires were designed to have an axle on both sides, and they're typically only about three quarter inch in diameter. So what people are then are forced to do is come in and machine out the center of the hub, and that weakens the casting because uh, they were never meant to be machined out. So we, we addressed the problem years ago. Uh, we simply manufacture our own hub. We produce a, a 4130 hub that has the wider, takes the side loads designed, and we lace it into a standard wheel and spoke. So this is an example. All this stuff comes pre-done with our kit. Uh, you don't have to go source it. Uh, if you were a scratch build or home build, you'd have to do that. In the early days, we had to do that. But now those type of things come done. We have a lot of other really neat things. Hinges have been something that uh, a lot of people have dealt with over the years. There's different versions. There's eye bolts. We've had a custom extrusion made. Uh, and then we machine a male-female half. Uh, I actually happen to have two females here, but then they will engage each other, and we have a very nice hinge set up. Uh, all that extrusion, we, we've gone out and had the extrusion made. We do all the machining for the kit. So, again, those types of items are just done. Uh, we do have a lot of unique gussets throughout our airplanes. Uh, for instance, a fuselage gusset would have 40 or 50 unique gusset shapes. Uh, this particular one, fuselage gusset number one, there would be six of them required in the kit. comes pre-machined. We have literally just hundreds of unique gusset shapes, pre-made. Every gusset comes with a part number and a tag already on it. This would be FG11, the 11th gusset you need when you're building the fuselage, and there would be 10 of them required. Uh, we do a lot of machine parts like compression strut plugs. Uh, an A and 5 bolt goes through this. It goes through a heavy-duty lift tank, through a drag any drag tank, and then into the spar. That's common across all of our airplanes. We do have a lot of commonality. I do have 20 unique airplanes, uh, but in compression strut plugs are going to be the same on all of them. On engine mount plugs are going to be the same on all of them. Axles are the same. The wheels are the same. Which is what they did in World War One. They didn't just redesign these airplanes. Uh, in fact, some of the French and German were using captured engines on each other's aircraft. So they, there was a lot of cross back then, and we were able to, it helped us a lot in the manufacturing. Uh, we machine certain items like push rod ends, a ball bearing rod end with thread in here, it's tapered down. All that machining is done for you. You know, you could certainly make that, but you'd have to have a lathe, you'd have to drill, you'd have to tap. We, we just take care of that for the kit. Uh, here's an example of a, a standard generic uh, st a stainless steel drag tank. We use these throughout all of our airplanes. We use them not only in the control system, we use them in the wing, we use them on the uh, cabane brace wires and stuff, and that, that's common across all 20 designs. For instance, this elevator push rod part is identical in all of our aircraft. So we do have a lot of crossover and commonality. Okay. Yeah, I know you've got a gas tank in there behind you. That's, That's correct, yeah. Uh, this is another example. Uh, a, a average builder home could not weld a fuel tank, so we fabricate custom aluminum fuel tanks specifically to fit each aircraft. The fittings are welded in uh, for the sight gauge to go in. On the bottom, we have a sump welded in the tank. We have a drain for the sump, a fuel pickup. Uh, all this has been welded, TIG welded, and pressure tested, so when you receive it, it's just ready for you to install in your airplane. That's the type of thing where an average home builder would get stuck on. It's just part of our kit. You takes, oh, 25, 30 minutes, you can install it in the airplane. Okay, so this is a secret right here, eh? This is, you've got all these diagrams, all this stuff hidden away in the back. This is where we start from. You know, a lot of people ask, where do we get our design data? How do we, how do we build a new airplane? We do a lot of custom development. People come to us, they want a one-off airplane. Some that, you know, there really aren't any plans, there aren't any kits. That's been our business. We, we develop those things. 
Here's one of our little trade secrets. We'll start with an, a, just a small sketch of something. This happened to be a three-view drawing that came out of a, a modeler's magazine. Uh, we take it into our computer and we scan it in. Then we print it out as large as we can possibly print it out. And that just, this happens to be that size. It's irrelevant. We just make it as large as we can. Then, as long as we have anything, we know a single dimension on the airplane, we can then scale it with a pair of calipers, determine what it should be. In this particular case, anything we measure, we're just going to multiply times 11.35. So I lay out the initial horizontal stabilizer locations, uh, the widths, the spans, the cord, uh, the fuselage layout. I just come up with the rough dimensions. And I say rough dimensions. We can typically get within about a sixteenth of an inch anywhere on an airplane once we've scaled it up to this point. So, uh, but you have to start with a pretty accurate drawing. So then I just literally lay out my dimensions and then I go back and I work my magic. Uh, as you may know, my airplanes, all they look like originals from the outside. The moment you get under the skin, they're totally unique. We have our own spars. We, because our spars are different thicknesses than the original, they may be entirely different locations than the original. Maybe an inch forward from where the original was, it may be an inch aft, those types of things. So I start from scratch when it comes to the design aspect. I, I use this type of dimension to get ideas. And then I apply my magic. I use my own hinges. I use my own aerodynamics. I use my own structural type of work. I use my own materials. I create a brand new airplane inside the shape of an old airplane uh, using some very basic materials. Then when I'm done, I go back and I reverse engineer it. After I've built the airplane, having built 61 airplanes from scratch, I've gotten fairly well, pretty good at it, I go back and I make a set of drawings to represent what I actually built. After the flight test is complete, then we offer a kit for it. Okay, uh, this is an example of one of our CNC machining centers. Earlier we were talking about the hinge. When we set up and make parts, we make hundreds at a time uh, because, again, they are uh, they fit across most of our airplanes. So here's an example of a hinge. I was telling you we have a male-female half. This male-female half locks in the vise. We have a set of tooling that indicates where it goes. We simply start the machine. It comes down, cuts across, steps over. Yeah, so it cuts a male-female half in about, I think, 47 seconds is the cycle time. We have a full set of parts comes back, stops, waits for you to put a new set in. Really handy for making parts. Once you've developed a part that you need, if you can use it across multiple airplanes, you have time savings there, and it helps us produce our kits much more economical. Another piece of equipment we have here we use a lot. It's a simple press break, but we have a set of flattening dies in it. We take a lot of round tubing and turn it into ovalized tubing for things like our struts, our landing gear legs, uh, a lot of items in airplanes. I'll show you an example of that. We basically put it in here. There is an adjustable stop. It has been preset. We bring it down to the final dimension. Turn the material out. Now we have a custom-made ovalized piece of tubing. Again, that's something that, that an individual home builder could do himself. It would just, you'd have to move a vise, scoot over, and do take quite a while. But anyway, we provide you a piece of tubing ready to install in your airplane. Okay, uh, basically what we have in the background, again, we just have a small finger break here where we can bend different certain things. We have a planishing hammer and a press, uh, just a hydraulic press. What's that picture up behind there? Oh, this this is the beginning of the DH2, just like I showed earlier. This is a set of drawings we started with, got some basic dimensions. Uh, we built a prototype, and as you know, that kit's now in production. We have several uh, customers flying them. This looks like it's the heart of your oil center. Yes, sir. There's, this is our hubs. We weld up, true them up. Uh, then as we lace the wheels over here, we've got a basic fixture. We set lace the wheels up. We put our indicator here and, and tr set our tracking and our truing. And those are all ready for the customer just installing the airplane. Um, all you have to do is mount his tire and tube. Here's another unique thing. A lot of people, you know, all of our kits have spun aluminum cowlings. If you had to make this at home on an English wheel, it would be very challenging. Uh, we own all the tooling and we custom make and spin every cowling one piece. It goes out to the customer. He simply attaches it to the airplane cuts out the face as he desires and it's got a really nice high quality finished product when he's done. Another unique product we offer over the years, uh, typical aircraft wheels were covered in the old days. What happens is the, the fabric will get in between the tire and the bead and cause the tire to come off the bead and the side load. So we've addressed the problem a little bit unique. We make a spun aluminum wheel cover. The center hole, it simply goes on. You'll drill three or four attached fittings with some uh, ADL clamps and attach the wheel cover the wheel. You have something that's incredibly tough, rock, things don't tear it, and it's pre-made with our kits. Really simple for, for a builder to install, and it keeps the airplane looking nice for years. Okay, this is our CNC plasma cutting table. Uh, most of our airplanes, or all of our airplanes, are riveted together structures. Each one of them has sometimes as many as 250 unique gussets to each airplane. Those come pre-done with the kit, kind of like I've shown you. Here is the, is the actual cutting table. Uh, this is example part we're going to make for you right now. I just just simply highlight it. I'm going to click cut. The machine is going to go over, come down, touch off on the metal, file the clip, follow the perimeter, and then when the part's done, we will simply deburr the part 
included in the kit. This is a standard gusset plate that would come out of the machine right there. There's a slight burr on the back, but a builder, again, we're going to take it and deburr it prior to putting in the kit, and then the builder can finish, dress it up, and ready to rivet on his airplane. Okay, here in the background are just a few of our poster boards. Uh, when we take an airplane to a show or something, we make up a unique poster. For instance, this is the Newport 28. Uh, it's got historical data, what ACES flew the airplanes and different things. And a lot of times we'll go into the exact aircraft, who flew the exact aircraft or the paint scheme and stuff. So it's good informative information for, for customers to walk by and see. But again, we have them on all of our unique designs. Robert, it looks like this is everything that you and I have ever done an interview on. Yes, sir. This is uh, this is the hangar, back home, you might say. Uh, we do have a lot of the airplanes apart in here. We just simply don't have the room. Like I said earlier, we're adding on a new, new facility. Uh, one of the unique things about my designs, all the wings come on and off real easy. They're all designed to plug onto sockets, put clevis pins in, takes just about 15 or 20 minutes. So when we return from an air show, it's, and again, we have the airplanes typically apart in the trailer anyway. It's easy to just roll them in or lay the wings off till we're ready to go fly them. Next time we're ready to fly them, it takes about 20, 30 minutes to reassemble the airplanes and go fly them. What all do you have in this hand? Oh, we have a lot of stuff. I'm standing right in front of a full-scale Fokker triplane uh, flown, flown by Lieutenant Von Raven. Here in the background, we have all of the Flyboys airplanes here in the facility. Uh, this is one of the Newport 17s, happened to be used by the young man Beagle, they thought might be a German spy at one point. That's the aircraft he was used in filming. Uh, we have other wings back there in racks. We have a Sopwith Pup. We have a, a couple Blarios. We have the Amelia Blario here, the one that was used in the movie. It's right down here at the other end. Uh, and of course, out in the outer hangars, there's a couple more of the Flyboys airplanes stored out there as well. Information or follow along on some of your uh, episodes here? Where do we get a hold of you? Uh, visit our Aerodrome Aeroplanes website. It's Aerodrome, A I R D R O M E, Aeroplanes, A E R O P L A N E S dot com. And our address is 929 Northwest Road 1571, Holden, Missouri 64040, and a phone number of 816. 230-8585.